So hi, I'm Mike Hendrickson. I've been at O'Reilly about 12 years. And a couple things that uh, during that time we've watched the publishing industry really transition. So what I want to talk today about is how we've seen publishing transition and how we're pushing it in the direction we think it should go. And from O'Reilly's perspective, we've always been embedded with open source communities. So that's something we're going to continue to push as well. So you may know us as kind of the company that publishes books with animals on them. We do a lot of other things. We have videos, events, and research, and different things like that. But one thing that, that really stands out about us is that Tim, our CEO and founder, really instills us all with this vision of doing, uh, you know, creating more value than we capture so that we're not into it just for the money when we do things. We have to have skin in the game with whatever we're doing. We also truly believe we're spreading the knowledge of innovators. So all the people in this room, the organizations you work with and work for, um, we want to help bring your information to the world. So that's one thing we do. Um, another one that's important that we're a little different than most publishing companies is we try to become part of the community. So we're not just the publishers that are going to siphon off whatever we can from your content. That's not our game. So um, that's one thing we do. We do events in person. Another kind of indication about O'Reilly's belief in open source, we don't put DRM in any of our books. We actually think if you're an author and you write a book, you take six months to write a book, and then we secure it so no one can get it. What, what good did that do you? You want your information in as many people's hands as possible. And we have a, an example here, the classic example, David Pogue used to write all of our Mac books, uh, you know, on Mac technology. And he, at the time, was with the New York Times, now he's at Yahoo. But he was very leery of us saying, we're going to release your book with no DRM. And so we finally convinced him to do it. We did an experiment with him where we put the book into the market, as it was. It sold really well. And it actually turned out that during that time, the first time ever that we, we had no DRM in his book, because he had always done them himself, is the book went crazy. We sold more copies than ever. And it was pirated everywhere. It was everywhere for free. But we still sold more copies than, than we had ever sold before. So, you know, the one thing that, that it really points to is that people that want good information will typically pay what they think it's worth. So we made enough money to make that work for us. It, it furthered our example that we don't need to protect content with DRM. And we're still doing it today. So everything we publish is DRM free. Interesting enough, we just had an agreement with Microsoft Press where we distributed them. And one of the, the points that was really difficult with them was convincing them to go DRM free in their books. We did. But then it lasted two years and now they're off on their own again. I think they're, <laughs> they're back to the DRM model. So, um, but so what we've been hearing, and, and we heard this constantly over the past few years, developers want more content earlier in the product life cycle or the, whatever your technology you're talking about. They want it more often and they want it continually updated kind of like software. But publishing was always this sort of afterthought that was this, you know, we, we created dead tree versions of software. And by the time we published it, the content was outdated at the very beginning. So what would it be like to have this sort of model where like an app, when you buy an app where you can get it updated? Why can't books do the same thing? So we're pushing that direction. And I think we're getting really close to doing that. So. What our authors and our communities do, one, we're, we are definitely advocates in open source. You all probably know Tim O'Reilly, who's from the very foundation at the start. We work together with the communities. We try to find out what's important to you and help amplify that in the market. So I, I was hate listening today here, and, and some of these foundations and organizations, I would love to have a closer relationship in how we can help bring content to the market much quicker and in multiple different formats. So I'll talk about that here shortly. Um, so we've got all sorts of different things. The biggest thing, though, for content, 
and for you and your open source communities. I, I heard a lot of people say your biggest asset is blob and X and Y and the source code. But if you can't have good documentation and good content about your products and what you're trying to develop, your community is going to struggle. You know, and maybe there's a reason why mail servers have so much activity on them is because there's a lot of questions about how does this work? Rather than having that canonical book that really describes what you want to do and have that book be free or have it be in a, in a format that I can read on my iPad rather than in, you know, printed copies. So we're looking at that. We've also got some, uh, a thing called integrated media strategy where not only is your content in a, in a format that people can read, but we also build other components around it, video, webcast, podcasts, things like that, that all build upon each other to make a richer, more immersive product. So that's something we're, we're bringing out too. Safari uh, just came back into O'Reilly's uh, house. We just repurchased it back. And so it, uh, it's about a 1.2 million subscriber base for all the tech publishers. Now I will admit it's every publisher, so there's open and non-open content in there. And um, it's, it is DRM oriented right now because it sits behind firewalls in large banking institutions. It kind of has to be for them. Their regulations require it. Um, also, we use DocBook in our tool chain. And actually, I, I just discovered this, that we actually created DocBook about 15 years ago. I, I didn't know. Um, it's one of those things that we just found out that we actually did create it. So one thing that we see in the changing landscape, and, and think about this, is part. Everything up here needs to be, needs to be, needs to be. But really, it should be is. We shouldn't be still talking about these things. It should be the way we're doing things. And I've got some numbers, I think, on the coming up slide here to show documentation still is an afterthought with developers. It's just like n almost non-existent for people. It's, you know, th they're worried about their API shipping or their code base, you know, but yet if they commented more thoroughly and delivered documentation with it, I think you get a lot more adoption a lot quicker. Um, so here's an example of where we've transitioned from. This is an early example of our Astra server book. So again, another one of these in the wild cases. And, and this, uh, why I'm showing you this is because I think it's important for the foundations here and, and, and people to know we publish both in an open way and in a totally closed way if you need it. But the idea, I think, is more important is the open way is the best success. Here's more than 45,000 units or roughly $900,000 or 700 pounds, so to speak, of a title that we've sold. But it's everywhere. It's in the, if you search on Wiki, on, on Google, you'll see there's a zillion hits. It's out there free everywhere. And yet we're still making it go really well. There's a zillion comments. Here's the most important part here. Typically, book publishing had maybe five people comment on it before they published it. 20,000? There's a huge difference. It's the crowdsourcing capability of publishing in an open way really makes a huge difference for us. So this is a little bit more about here's and it, it, that that early model of just putting it on the author's website led us to thinking, well, let's do something called the open feedback publishing system that used wiki format and we got comments on it and it was okay. It was kind of a transition. Um, I think we were using media wiki at the time with this. Then it led us to another idea. Let's put all of our content in a wiki format that we want updated. So things that we're no longer interested in, we were going to put out to the communities and say, go at it. It's yours, you know, have it. It went okay. Uh, there was a, I don't know, few hundred thousand people that connected to that and, and, and got involved. And then it led us to believe, well, maybe this is something that our corporate customers want. So we did early release and rough cuts in this tool called Safari, which is subscription based. And that was to help get our corporate people involved earlier on. Um, and the last two led us to ASCII doc and then Gollum sitting on top of GitHub. We had this whole elaborate tool chain. 
you, you must understand that tool chain came from what we used years ago. We had everyone in the publishing industry, unfortunately, used either Microsoft Word or FrameMaker. And there was a few, um, PageMaker was another one that people used here and there. But those three were really the dominant tools. We started to convert. So our Word, we took over Word. We basically built macros that let us export to DocBook. We still had to send it to India to get it converted and then bring it back before we could load it into our websites. It, this is the way it had to work. So the, the tool chain was really broken, even though we had our own macros built around it. So we then started looking at ASCII doc. We used Gollum on top of GitHub. It really started us thinking that there's something more here. And so I, we, we've got a new tool now, and it's going to sit on top of GitHub, but I want to just give you a little, uh, little idea here what the problem is in the world with documentation. So you can use Google BigQuery, and it, the queries are simple to use, and you can run it on GitHub. And you can pull back all the data you want on anything, on all repositories. So I looked for documentation. And there were, you know, there's, what, 2 million repos? repos. There's that many repos that are language-oriented. Only that many had documentation. It's basically, you know, that many people care about documentation with their products. If developers, so another plea to all of you, if you have developers you're working with or your foundation does, get them to write documentation on their content. I mean, I know it's a, an afterthought typically, but so here, here they are by languages, and you know, it's, it's almost the same as usage, um, that sort of thing. So last year on GitHub, there were 7,000 projects. This year, there are 11, so little growth. Not really, because the growth in repos really outdid the growth in docs. So the documentation percent actually went down. It's not a huge decrease, but it's really kind of pathetic that that's what we are facing right now. So there's definitely a need for more. Um, and, and part of it is the tooling system to write documentation isn't natural for most people. So the other part of our new tool chain, it's called Atlas. And we are going to be releasing it as an open source project down the road. Right now, there's a couple proprietary tools for rendering in there that we haven't disentangled yet. So um, we're getting there. But I think part of the problem is that the tooling, writing documentation, hasn't been easy and natural for people. With our new tool chain, the way it works, if you want to work in VI or Emacs, it doesn't matter. You just push through Git, and it will show up in your repo in Atlas. Atlas lets you render. This is our Atlas thing. Atlas will let you render to all different formats. You can actually work in your browser in a WYSIWYG if that's what floats your boat. Or you can work again at the command line and push through Git. So we're trying to make it as easy and natural for developers to create documentation because I think that is the biggest barrier is that it's not easy and natural for people. But the, the great thing about it, once you get to that point, if you've got it in a markdown language that we've wrapped on this, you can update it any given time. So much like an app that goes out and gets updated, we can update content that's in the field. That's really, that's powerful for publishing because we've never been that way before. The other thing is we can print now that same base and have physical copies of a book if you need them in less than 10 days. So, you know, once you've updated, you push the button, commit, you're there. The other great thing that I like about it is the forking ability. Think about content. Do we only have one language in this world? Well, some of us, mostly Americans, think that we only have one language in the world. But really, the, the great thing about this is you can fork at the very beginning and have your Chinese and your Italian and your French version being written at the same time on the same base. So that's, that's the other nice thing. And publishing's never seen that before. It's always a year to two years later the international editions came out. So we're looking at that as helping it out. Um, so again, it sits on top of GitHub, uh, can use it. I, I kind of think about it as distribution with benefits. 
because you can actually, you can push it out, you just click off whether you want PDF, Mobi, EPUB, or HTML. It's actually HTML5. You can embed rich media into it. So video, you can have live JavaScript in it. And that renders to your devices when, you, when we send it out. So that's, I think that's the proprietary pieces that are making it so it's difficult. We also have themes, and it's all based on CSS and all that. So it's actually quite a, quite a nice way. But I think the important message, too, is engage with your communities, but make documentation the core of that engagement. Don't just have them all out on doing their own thing, but actually build it as part of your center part in your engagement. We have more than 1,200 projects in Atlas right now, in the new one, and I guess the last one there is Young Coders is fairly new. Um, and everything that we're seeing from big 600-page books all the way down to the little 10, 15 page book, which is another important thing to think about here. Make your content what it needs to be and no more. So many people think bigger is better in content size. It makes it look like a substantial book. It must be real and good. No way. The best book ever is Kernahan and Ritchie's C Programming, and it's 256 pages. Kind of an interesting number that they came up with. I thought you were going to say struck and white uh, elements. <laughs> that's a, that's a great book. <laughs> well, uh, Cornelian Ritchie is struck and white for C. It really is. I mean, that's what it what it is. So, um, the other the other part is be where your developers are, and that's that's where we are. So, um, I think uh, this guy wrote a great testimonial about Atlas, Scott Chacon. Lastly, we are bringing our premier open source event. Sorry, this is a plug, but yeah. it's a plug because it's related to you folks oh, here. Great. That's great. Yeah. We're doing a European event. Oh, okay. and, and yeah, and we're also looking at Asia as well. So, but this is announced. This is definitely happening. We're going to be sending out the call for papers, the participation, everything for you folks. So, speak at OSCON Europe.